and is not only um, a very distinguished academic who's been director of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew and scientific director of the Eden Project in Cornwall and is visiting professor at Reading University and has held academic posts in the United States, um, spent many years on field work in the Amazonian, in, the Amazonian, in Amazonian Brazil, uh, and has a worldwide interest in the sustainable development of rainforest ecosystems and conservation. So I think this is a lifelong passion. Um, uh, he has published 19 books, has edited another 16, and over nine, 590 papers on plant systematics, plant ecology, ethnobotany, and conservation. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society, was in, awarded the International Cosmos Prize for his environmental work in the Amazon and has held numerous posts at universities and other foundations overseas and here in the UK. And as well as all that, he's a deacon at Lyme Regis Baptist Church and is also a patron, one of our patrons, a patron of Green Christian. So it's our enormous privilege to have you here this morning, Gillian, and we're looking forward very much to hearing what you have to say. So Gillian, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Deborah, very much for that kind introduction. First of all, may I say what a privilege it is and I am very glad that Green Christian has arranged this festival at such a difficult time, a strange time in our midst at the moment. So it's been a joy to me to take part in everything that's gone so far. Thank you especially to the organizers and to Barbara for your part in it and Barbara who got hold of me at short notice to take part in this. And I would like to now share my screen and uh, I've never done this before but we'll see what happens when I press the green button or anything else. Right, uh, now I was asked to speak about carbon, but when I listened to everything here, I felt that I'd make it a bit more personal and uh, talk about my concerns. And it brings together almost everything that we have seen in this festival so far. Joel, thank you for doing uh, the introduction just now in your songs, because as you can see on the screen, my talk is about laments, and about hope. So I really appreciated uh, those two songs that gave us an introduction to the theme. My biggest concerns in this entanglement, as some people said yesterday, are climate change, the loss of biodiversity, and the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with the lament side of it and uh, then we'll go on to hope. These are two of the books that I edited. Uh, you just mentioned that I'd edited several books. Well, look at the titles. 1977 published Extinction is Forever. And this was about our loss of species of the world. And I brought together a big group of scientists and we lamented what was going on in 1977. In 1986, in Washington, D.C., I coordinated a symposium called Tropical Rainforests and World Atmosphere. And that was about climate change in 1986. Now, I am very sad, I lament, that have we gone very far since then? Not enough. Uh, there hasn't been nearly enough progress. And I am glad that the theme that has come out here on this conference has been urgency. I think uh, that came right from the very start from uh, Jonathan Porritt, that the whole situation is urgent. That means it's a big burden on us at this time. Well, look at the things that have happened in those areas that uh, I am concerned with. I think these are familiar. I don't need to go into the details of climate change, the loss of biodiversity and indigenous peoples. But I 
do draw attention to the one at the bottom middle, which was published two weeks ago by the Royal Botanic Gardens Q in their report, The State of the Plants and Fungi of the World. It's a good summary and uh, it's available online if you want to look at it. And one of the conclusions on it is that two in five plants are estimated to be threatened with extinction. So these plants upon which we depend are going extinct. Above is an animal that I've had the privilege to see in Costa Rica, but it is now extinct, the golden toad. Then in my work, inevitably, I've spent quite a lot of time with indigenous peoples. And look at the top right hand graph and the area in orange. Those are the number of indigenous leaders that have been assassinated since 2007. It is going on around the world, particularly in Brazil and Indonesia at the moment. And each time we lose one of those, we lose a whole body of information. And then look down below when you see gold miners in indigenous territory of uh, three tribes in Brazil, including my beloved Yanomami, with whom I have spent uh, more than a year living amongst. And it's much worse than in this graph, figures from 2019. There are bigger invasions of those. Now, we could add to the graph at the top, COVID now. Those are assassinations by landowners and big companies who've arranged it. But on top of this, we now have COVID that is infected because they have little resistance. And so people like uh, various chiefs uh, have gone extinct, uh, have been, uh, been died. Chief Aritana and uh, the wife of a chief I know very well, Rioni, have both died of COVID. And so that is another problem. But I don't want to dwell on the lament too long. You have done that well in various presentations. And I also think that during this festival so far, you've given us hope, as Joel just did now. So this is something that has taken me through all this sad time of watching the forest disappear, of seeing the Indians in the Amazon decline. It has been my faith. And so I put these two verses up for you to lead us into a time of hope and think about this for the rest of uh, my short talk. So I leave you particularly that text from Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I think that is a good motto for what we have been talking about in this festival. And I just hope that uh, we can take that home and work towards giving that hope. So we begin with hope for the climate. And uh, some of the hope measures I see are small. At the top, you see the roof of my house and you see uh, hot water heating and you see photovoltaic. This is a small thing but that and my wood pellet boiler have reduced my carbon footprint enormously. We all need to do that. My church, uh, Lyme Regis Baptist Church, has got photovoltaic on its roof. That's one reason why it is a, now an eco church, a silver eco church. But that is a small thing. We need to get much larger in our transformation of getting rid of fossil fuels. On the 6th of October, as you see, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson promised a revolution in green power generation with every home powered by wind. We're rather on the way for there. So we need this large scale 
but you can see what I put below. Let us hold him to it. We've had good talks about political influence. In fact, yesterday, one that gave us hints of how to go to our MPs. And uh, that is good advice uh, that contacting, writing, if we really want a uh, bigger change to happen. And I put this one in about vehicles that don't use fossil fuel. The blue car there is in India. Just recently, I had the privilege of traveling in a hydrogen powered car, fuel cell car in an aerodrome in the UK, an experimental car of Toyota. It was great fun driving across an airfield in this, but it was also hope and joy because out of the exhaust was dripping water and it's using hydrogen. I personally feel there's a greater fuel, a greater future in hydrogen power for our vehicles than there is in electric, but I put an electric one down below. Currently, I only drive a hybrid, but my next car will be certainly uh, completely electric. And my <laughs> daughter and son-in-law each have fully electric cars now. I'm proud of them because they generate the power for their, to charge their cars in the photovoltaic on their roof in Plymouth. We can do these small things and they mount up. I now put on the Svalbard Seed Bank. This in a way bridges the gap from getting rid of fossil fuel to biodiversity. This bank was built in Svalbard because it is a permafrost area to hide the seeds for the future of crop plants. Uh, at Kew, we have a seed bank for wild species. This is for crop plants, but the two collaborate with each other. But the interesting thing is that in 2019, the bank in Svalbard was threatened because the ice began to melt around the entrance and water was trickling down that corridor into the seed bank. So they had to do emergency work on it. So here we, because of the permafrost, we're trying to put seeds where nature keeps them cool. And so we don't need to spend a lot on refrigeration, but climate change is affecting that. So that's rather an anachronism that uh, where we put those seeds now, it is affected by climate change. Well, from that, we can go into some hope for biodiversity. This is a reserve in Brazil, only an hour's drive from Rio de Janeiro, called the Reserva Ecologica Guapiaçu. I have been involved with it since it began, when a student did a study of birds on a farm that was half forest and half farmland. And the result of it was that the farmer gave 500 hectares to form a reserve because of the bird list that that student had made. That was 15 years ago. Now, through the help of many people, including the World Land Trust, we have bought bits and bits and pieces. And this reserve, owns over 5,000 hectares, and it takes care of 8,000 hectares now. You can see on the top right that uh, the nursery where we're planting trees, and the photo in the middle is a reforested area. Rewilding is so important today. And about half the land that we bought for this reserve was pasture, and about half of it was forest. You can see the mountains behind. The reserve goes from about sea level to 2,000 meters. So that's why it has such a wonderful richness of birds and plants. But it needed to be reforested as well. In the bottom right, you see a very young, the beginning of plantings, all native trees. If you want to go and see it, when one can travel again after COVID, in the center at the bottom is a lodge. We bought an old farm, restored it, and this is for bird watching and ecotourism. 
and that's giving the income of running this reserve. So it's paying for itself now from ecotourism, or it will again when we can travel, and it is restoring the rainforest in the Brazilian Atlantic rainforest, which only has 6% of the original forest left. So what more important area to rewild than this? So I have hope when I see how one student starting his doctoral thesis there has led to a very important reserve that is forming a corridor between two other reserves. So the small here is turning into large. I was very distressed a month ago when President Bolsonaro, the Trump of Brazil, uh, repealed the legislation protecting the mangroves around Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. He said, these are in the way. Mangrove forest everywhere in the tropics is one of the most important forests in the world because it stabilizes coastline, it's full of fish, and it is the livelihood of many people just for its fishing. And I am happy, the hope is that Judge Maria Cavallo in October this year gave the order that that stopped this, that blocked the moves to repeal the mangrove protections. We haven't talked in this festival today really about that part, the legislative part. Uh, and in several cases, there's been legislation from the courts that have gone against some of the destructions. And I see hope in that because this is actually not the only one that I know about that uh, Brazil where the judiciary has taken care of it rather than uh, the politicians. I made two visits to Colombia last year before my travel stopped with uh, COVID and I had a lot of contact with the Colombian uh, authorities because I was uh, initiated as a member of the Colombian Academy of Sciences but I attended a conference in the Amazon part of Colombia, and I worked in uh, two botanical institutes in Colombia. But I was oh, really overjoyed that they had a governor's conference in Colombia in May last year, and it brought together the governors of each state or province in Colombia, Peru, Brazil, and Bolivia. And those governors were discussing protecting their rainforests. The presidents of these countries are not, on the whole, good conservationists. But I saw that the governors are beginning to realize the importance of their forests. So they are hope. And I'm keeping in contact with some of those because I think there is hope for the future of the biodiversity of the rainforest through initiatives like this, and we need to encourage and support them. One of the things that is linked to climate change, to the protection of biodiversity, is food, because we can't uh, isolate ourselves from the question that we need to keep our land to be productive in order that we don't cut down more land. We need to reforest some of the destroyed lands. So I'm in favor of people who are trying to make their land more productive. Here is a picture of an organic farmer in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Leontinho Balbo. And you only have to look at those statistics when you compare them with the destructive farms that I've seen. Most of his land is sugarcane, he has forest where you find puma and ocelots and maine wolves. And by going this way, where he's not burning off every year, he's getting 24% more sugar out of that land than uh, the next door farmers in Sao Paulo. And the last area I mentioned that concerns me greatly are the indigenous people. 
I am very glad that uh, several times in this conference, people have mentioned the importance of indigenous wisdom. Jonathan Porritt certainly began us with that. And he talked about the wisdom of Thomas Berry. Wonderful man, I too think that he has contributed a great deal to the environmental movement and the ethics of the environmental movement and the religious aspect of it. But one of his points was the importance of indigenous wisdom. And I think several other speakers also mentioned this. Uh, Cleo Lake, Melanie Nazareth were two of the others that talked about this. So I was glad that uh, some of the people in this festival have been thinking about indigenous wisdom. And some other wisdom is making the land more productive without destroying the land. So here's an example on the left from Costa Rica and on the right from Borneo. Indigenous peoples around the world are managing the land much more sustainably. Why haven't we learnt? I spent a lot of time with uh, some of these people and seen they cut down a small area of forest, but then they manage it and they have very highly productive land that feeds enough people. We need to learn to have mixed cultivation, like uh, that one in Borneo that you see on the screen. This is a hero, the president of the Warani of Ecuador, Nemonti Nakimo. She was featured in Time magazine very recently, but she is from the Warani. Now, some of you may remember the Auka and the five missionaries that were assassinated when they tried to establish contact with the Warani and how uh, Rachel Saint, the widow of one of them, went back. The Warani, many of them are now Christians, but what they're struggling with is the loss of their land by petroleum companies. So Nemonti went to the courts about it. So here is another example of a lawsuit which she won to protect the ancestral territory in Ecuador. What a wonderful state of hope that uh, that is too. So uh, I see that even with the loss of indigenous people and their culture, there are great signs of hope. And I'm delighted that green Christians and other Christian organizations are doing things to uh, be part of this contribution. This list of different organizations, which I'm sure you all know, is an important one because it uh, shows that the church is waking up. We've discussed this uh, quite a lot during this festival, and uh, I would just urge you to keep in touch with these organizations and help to go on. The top right-hand corner is the roof of our church hall in Lyme Regis. You can see the uh, solar panels on it that are generating electricity and reducing our carbon footprint. And one of the reasons why we are a silver church. It wasn't easy. In fact, in one of the discussion groups that we had in this conference, I was saying how difficult it was to uh, interest the congregation to start with. But once it gets going, there's an enthusiasm about it. So make sure that this is into your churches as well. S sign of hope to me is this beginning in the churches to do something about creation. I was two weeks ago invited to give the Harvest Even song to preach at it in Winchester Cathedral. A eco-church, an eco-cathedral. And so I saw there an awakening of uh, this Christian interest in things. But to end with, I want to take up this other theme that most speakers have in this festival, the importance of youth.
I've had the opportunity to speak in a, quite a lot of schools, to work with children at the Eden Project in Cornwall, and I'm all for Greta and what she has done, because the politicians are still asleep and we need to shake them up. So those of you who are in this meeting that have taken part, thank you for taking part in, in the extinction movement, because extinction, as we see in the recent report from Q, is so real. The bottom photo is a photo taken two years ago in Manaus in Brazil. And that photo has in it my, some of my students, some of my grand students, and some of my great grand students. How it brings me joy that those students that I, in a course that I set up in Brazil in 1973, have taught others, and those others have taught others. And they're mostly working on environmental things and not gaining knowledge about the Amazon rainforest. We need to spend time with youth. Look at these children from Arosha, South Africa. Look at their joy where they're learning about plants. Or look at these children fascinated with a kingfisher and watching the man in the front ringing a kingfisher so that they can make observations about it in our Russia, in the Czech Republic. All these things give me hope. And so I am at times in the phase of lamenting, at times I am hoping, but we can reimagine the promised land. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Gillian, for this fascinating and very inspiring talk. It's right to begin with lament, I think, but then to move into our Christian hope and what, what we can do and what can be done. And you are a complete inspiration. And I love the idea of your great grand students. I think that is absolutely marvellous.